Okay, here's the Mayo Clinic from this view. Kind of a cloudy day. And uh, this is Friday. And, uh, 16th or something. And uh, I'm still doing appointments and treatments and everything. So I thought I'd do a film. I turned the camera sideways this time. And uh, I think that's the dad. I'm gonna go over there and look at this. And uh, the bronze ones over there, I don't know if you can see them in the foreground. It's the two brother, two sons, or two brothers. And uh, the other day I mentioned that I thought, you know that great big male building you're looking at right there, enormous, in the parking garage here with the mirror looking sides. Um, that's just a small portion of this place. Uh, not a small portion, it's a huge portion, but there's there are other the Gonda and uh, Hilton and three or four other huge buildings attached to this besides the Methodist Hospital and then up the street is St. Mary's, uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, that guy there, I'm going to go look at the thing there and then that woman see what's going on with them. I just, I don't see the plot. Here it is over here. Let's see what it says about that guy. That might be the dad, I don't know. He's the doctor. And I don't, she's, these were Catholic uh, nuns and stuff, so she's probably that. Mother, Mother M. Alfred Mose, 1829 to 1899, cast bronze by Mike Mangers and Dr. William Worrell Mayo 1819 to 1911 cast bronze 1915 so that'd be the the originator here uh, by Leon Cruel on August 21st 1883 a tornado devastated Rochester Following the storm, Dr. William Worrell Mayo entrusted the care of the injured to Mother M. Alfred Mose and her community of Franciscan sisters. After the crisis passed, Mother Alfred suggested to Dr. Mayo that Rochester needed a hospital. She promised the sisters would build it if Dr. Mayo and his sons would draft, would staff it. At first hesitant, Dr. Mayo accepted the offer. On September 30th, 1889, St. Mary's Hospital opened and was so successful that an addition was needed within five years. The Mayo medical practice of today is known worldwide thanks in large, in a large, in large measure to the vision, cooperation, and dedication of these two remarkable individuals, a country doctor and the mother superior of a Franciscan community. Their values were expressed in an enduring partnership. So that's who they are. That's Mother M. Alfred Mose, 1829-1899, and uh, Dr. William Worrell Mayo, 1819-1911. And uh, they did quite a remarkable accomplishment here in, in the world of medicine, for sure. And these are the sons up here. I end up, I got ALS. And uh, almost with a certainty they're doing a gene test right now. But it's just 99.9. And whoever thinks something like that's going to happen to you, you know. So that gives me, it's a death sentence. It's just a, a few years to live. There's the Mayo Clinic. And, uh, no fun at all and there's just no cure they don't know where it comes from what causes it they got nothing that will do anything for it some some a uh, couple of meds that are you know from the pharmaceuticals that are not anything to brag about and i'm not even going to take them they're uh, 
not because I'm so anti-meds, which I am, but because they're so weak and lame and ineffective and unknown and the side effects that uh, you might get an extra three months or something and they might improve things a little. But they're not uh, highly recommending the Mayo here. Uh, so that says something right there. Uh, I am on the list with the Mayo here for studies related to this ALS. And uh, I may, they'll be calling me and they will decide whether they want me to participate. It's the main entrance right here into the Mayo Clinic. Uh, all the little buses and vans and the hotels and shuttles and everybody. There's actually half a dozen different entrances here. And this is kind of front and center here. And these are all nurses and personnel and everybody. It's a busy little town. It's about 8.30 in the morning, I guess. I, my first appointment today is only not till 11.15. I got to do another MRI and they're trying to figure out my stomach. I got two things going on at once here. I, uh, uh, when I eat, it makes me just deathly sick. And that's totally unrelated to this ALS. The ALS, my symptoms were, my hands were uh, anthropy or however they say that. And uh, where they kind of losing muscle mass and, and weak and can't even turn an ignition on a car, you know. Can, but I got to really work at it and I got to put my other hand over and help it and anything I try so that's those are my symptoms along with there's a little muscle twitching and and there's um, you know they've done a Jesus I don't know if I could say 50 different blood tests because the last one which was yesterday now after two weeks of this she had about nine different little vial things that she was filling and the Mayo, they don't leave a stone unturned, you know. They want to get the right diagnosis and uh, they want to get the, uh, you know, take the right steps. So that's what we're doing. So this stomach thing has it, got us, uh, there's a kind of, I don't know the name of it, it's a pleurosis that millions of people have, a kind of a virus bug in their stomach. Uh, uh, and they're thinking it could be that. But I still think it's the gallbladder, even though I don't have gallstones, which would cause my symptoms. My symptoms there are if I eat, it started out meat, meat and fat. I didn't know it at first. I thought I was pepper maybe causing that, or and I, I would get sickly, almost you could say almost deathly sickly, pain in my stomach and vomiting and just serious for hours and hours. And uh, six hours it turns out to be the main time frame of that. And then it'll pass finally. And it turns out it was meat. And I finally, after figuring that out, it took a while. Because uh, I was eating sandwiches and chips and this and that and the other thing. But it turns out it was meat. Well, now last night I got deathly sick right here at the clinic uh, around quitting time. I did another MIR yesterday, or MRI. And, and it was really intense for a couple hours of imaging there and um, so finally I get to eat because I had to fast like I'm fasting now for, for the today's one at 11 15 and um, but I got I, so I come out and I keep them keep some some of the foods that I can't eat which surprisingly enough is like peanut butter and jelly and uh, walnuts and uh, bananas and, and, and then I had some cheese. For some reason, I had been able to eat American cheese. Now, I can't eat butter. I got deathly sick eating some butter on some bread here a week or so ago. Boy, when that baby comes on, you know it. And you're, and you're there for six hours of suffering. I mean, it's suffering enough that some people go to the hospital. I know that it's going to pass. So that's, I don't even have to consider it. Well, I just considered it last night again. And I do better, you know, because it's just, it's going to go. And sure enough, it finally did. But mine was without meat last the one last night around five o'clock. And uh, but I did eat some of that cheese. So now I'm gonna eliminate I'll go the I think vegans they call them. It's zero. Egg I mean already I'm off of eggs because eggs did it to me before too. But now what is it? See that's that's what we're after. We wanna nail this thing and we might if it if it turns out that one that they claim there's millions of people live with that. But I got kind of a flunky 
gastrologist here, of all things, at the Mayo Clinic. And, and uh, they are doing things, and I did get him. I had to step on his toes a little bit. I had to go to a patient um, oh, resource and, and uh, file a complaint. And, and then I got to see the supervisor, and this guy got more attentive here. He was kind of blowing this thing off. You know, like, I, you know, they, they do, got a lot of things that are going, so he didn't have it blown off entirely. But he was supposed to call me on a Monday or a Tuesday, no call. And, and, and I do. So, so I, and then now he's, he's got me going to a uh, gallbladder surgeon to get his opinion on, on whether this thing is crystals or not. Because I'm thinking my symptoms don't match up with them millions of people with that, that uh, stomach problem like that. Because I don't see millions and millions of people having that, just living with that commonly. Uh, with my acute symptoms, you know, like right now I haven't eaten anything, I feel perfect, you know. Uh, so, but, but uh, and I could eat the appropriate things here. Like usually if I wasn't fasting this morning, I would have had that at the Dorothy Day there, I'd had orange juice and, uh, uh, raisin bran cereal with nothing on it, just the dry cereal, and uh, toast uh, of whatever variety of bread, uh, whole wheat a lot of times, and then peanut butter on it with nothing. No, I make sure I don't. I don't know if it's butter or margarine. I don't take no chances. So I would have eaten that, let's say, 30 minutes ago or an hour, and I'd be just fine all morning here. But had I got any meat or dairy or animal in there, in the animal fat. I'd be knocked for a loop, I'm big time. I don't know why they don't do a test when you're actually having that happen. I'm gonna ask them that when I get a chance here. How come they don't do that? And then measure the bile and what's going on? Cause it's just, uh, you know, I can't even describe it. Uh, I'm, I'm, you can't vomit. If you could, the one time I was able to vomit, actually two out of about 20 times I've had this thing take place in the last 50 days. I've actually probably had it happen about 30 times in the last 80 days and, and uh, before I got it figured out boy I don't eat that stuff but it's um, if it, it, the few two times out of that I vomited and then I got better well that's typical of it food poisoning or something you get it out of your system but um, you can't vomit and it's just absolutely but wanting to vomit and just bowl over in a ball almost of that stomach pain and there I'm driving truck you know, harvesting them spuds, you know, which is not a big deal. I can take pain and, and, and when I have to. I don't like it like anybody else. But, uh, so I'm not, you know, a super tough guy or nothing. But, but I needed to keep them loads going and it was going to be whether I was driving or not driving. The pain was not going to go away. I could be laying in a bed and the pain was still there. So there was no benefit to laying there balling or something. And, 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 and you know, it doesn't make you fall. Boy, it hurts, and, and, uh, and you're glad when it passes. So I had one of those last night from 5 to 8.30, because I had just eaten a little bit of that American cheese, and it finally passed. I had to actually sit here in the lobby at the mail. So here I am, more appointments, dealing with the stomach issues, and that uh, whatever it turns out to be, I still think it's uh, gallbladder myself. And it's, they call them crystals if you don't have stones. And mine is not showing stones. Then they got what they call sludge, which is pre-crystals. And then they say some of it can be brought on from cholesterol. Well, I've been on a whole all-meat diet for the most part, like when I wasn't binging, for years. So typically, I, I don't didn't ever really have my uh, cholesterol tested that much. I don't think it was ever sky high. But uh, some of those uh, sludge and... Uh, crystals form from uh, high cholesterol but my doc wasn't gonna he was just gonna put me on antibiotics and go after this other thing that it is and I said well that's all well and good except that's six weeks of that and then six weeks more to see if it did it and that's a hell of a long time to have this condition if, if we need to do some more testing here and he he did agree with me when I nailed his ass to the wall yeah, I mean, you hate to do something like that, and you don't expect something like that at the mail. And then the supervisor comes down, and she's this classy broad. And, uh, and the black guy who was the head doctor, this is a resident uh, trainee, shooting all these shots and making all these decisions. 
which is part of the male process, and I respect that thoroughly. But uh, the black guy who was the real doctor, I will call him, uh, he don't talk, he's uh, African black and very articulate. And uh, they got like six words from him the first day and uh, at the end of the meeting with this resident who does all the interviewing. And uh, he suggested that that guy was, was, did a real good job. He was really like it, it, that he was there. Cause I said, you're, you're the main doc. And he said, yes. So they got those six words. And, and um, then the second time, all I got was a smile when I was leaving. And, and so this guy, I'm counting on this resident to convey and communicate. And the guy is not doing a very good job of it because uh, he's just a little, he's kind of squirrely. But now I, I got some more people coming in now because of my bringing it to a head here, which I hated to have to do it. But I was getting at the, the supervisor there now. She's just, oh, this guy's so great, this black guy. Well, if that guy's so great, how come he don't talk? You know, he, that's part of the deal here, you know, that, that he's, he's the guy managing this, and we have a discussion of what's, what's occurring, but he can't talk. He can, he can talk professionally with the, with the professional staff, and she's all snazzy in her hot pants, and, and um, 